Welcome to Christ Church Worship. My name is Pastor Mark Pearson. Christ Church is an evangelical covenant church in Portland, Maine, and we welcome you this morning. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, the first of six Sundays, the first of 40 days, well, just into the 40 days preceding Easter, which is the great celebration of the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. I'm not sure why it's taken me until just recently to realize that Lent is not so much about any particular discipline, about giving up a bad habit, as it is about practice in developing a godly life. It's a much broader framework to see these days of preparation and really to see our whole lives. We're not just looking to let some things go. We're not looking just to sin less. We're looking to be God-centered and fully alive in his presence. Good news is, Psalm 25 shows us that this good, godly life can be learned by the grace of God. Join me in reading responsibly. Psalm 25, the middle part of it anyway. I'll read the light type, you read the bold face. We'll begin our worship together. Show me your ways, Lord. Guide me in your truth and teach me. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love. Do not remember the sins of my youth. According to your love, remember me. Good and upright is the Lord. Will you join me in prayer? Great, gracious, holy, heavenly Father, we come to you today seeking to be in your presence, seeking to be transformed by your presence, seeking to be forgiven and made new. We know that Jesus has already paid for our sin. We ask that you now wash us clean and fill us with your spirit so that we might live uh, gracious, good, godly lives. Teach us to love one another well. Teach us to pray, even as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One of the ministries we really enjoy celebrating and have celebrated and worked with and volunteered at for a couple of decades now is the very effective root cellar. The root cellar in downtown Portland is is an amazing place for the gathering of quite a number of people, especially many of the newest Mainers. Let's take a look at this video together and how you might be able to support the root cellar even more. Hi, I'm Joel Furrow, and I have a special message for you as we end 2020 and look ahead to 2021. Our neighbors this past year have felt the uncertainty and the stress just like you at home have. They're worried about putting food on the table for their kids. They're worried about their kids' education. They're worried about how to stay healthy. These are things we all have in common this year. Through it all, our mission has been the same. Love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. Thanks to you and so many others, through your generous giving and prayer, we've been able to do just that. Knowing that you were with us, we expanded our hours and made our food programs more accessible. We've distributed more than 200,000 pounds of food to both to our neighbors in Portland and Lewiston, serving over 600 residents every other week. Our English classes look different this year, but our neighbors are even more committed to learning the English language and building a future in Maine. We found new ways to meet and build friendships. In Lewiston, Fruitful Sewing produced hundreds of masks for the neighborhood, an act of generosity that led to paid jobs for immigrant women through a local business partner and college campuses. Since 1984, 
We have opened our doors for children and teens. When schools closed in March, we were ready, offering grade level education packets and distributing school lunches. Summer brought some new challenges, but our team found ways to safely open super summer day camps for children in the East End neighborhoods of Portland and the Tree Street neighborhood of Lewiston. Thanks to your generosity, 21 neighborhood teens were given jobs through Lucru Lawn Care, as well as being tutors and mentors in our super summer day camp program. Throughout the current school year, your generosity once again has given us the opportunity to stand in the gap for elementary, middle, and high school students through our safe learning hubs, offering tutoring, remote learning access, and a ton of fun. As we turn the page on 2020 and look ahead, we are asking you to join us once again. We anticipate that our learning hubs will still be active through most, if not all, of 2021 school year. This means more supplies, more staffing, and more opportunities to demonstrate the love of God by offering hope and peace, no matter what comes in the next year. In order to do that, we need you and others like you to step up as monthly partners. Monthly partners have always been the backbone of our ministry. Giving faithfully each month allows us to plan and respond quickly to the needs of our neighbors. Maybe you've thought about being a monthly partner before, but there's never been a better time. Thanks to a few of our advisory group members, we have an $11,000 match challenge starting today through January the 15th. If you make a year-end donation and become a monthly partner, your donation will be matched six times for the first six months. So $20 becomes 40, 40 becomes 80, 80 becomes 160, you can do the math. Will you join us and stand in the gap for our neighborhood kids? We believe that 2021 will be a year to remember God's faithfulness and an opportunity to see his kingdom come and his will be done in our neighborhoods. And with you by our side each month, we can continue to offer hope, joy, and peace no matter what comes. There's a few ways to sign up. Click the link below, and you'll get all the details. I hope that you will join us as we seek the peace of our cities in 2021. May you and yours have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Our gospel reading for this morning is from the book of Mark, and Mary will read for us uh, from Mark chapter 8. Jesus is very clear what his life is about. He knows he's come from the Father. He knows he has a specific mission, and he works hard to not only to live into that mission, but to complete that mission. He wants to finish well, even though what looks like the finish to his disciples will be absolute disaster. Jesus knows what he needs to do, and he wants to finish well. Listen as Mary reads. Good morning. The first scripture for today is from Mark. Mark 8, 27 to 33. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others say one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. In our New Testament reading, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, saying that while he knows and they know that grace isn't ever earned, it does require effort. We live into the godly life and it takes a fair amount of effort. And Paul uses a, a great metaphor about running so that you can gain the prize. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may attain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not aim aimlessly. I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself will be found disqualified. 
The word of the Lord. Our hymn this morning is Take Time to Be Holy. It does take time to become holy. It takes practice. It takes effort. It takes focus. It takes attention. And it, and it takes time. Let's take time to sing. Take time to be holy. And let that seep into us. Remember that one of the first things Jesus preaches is turn around. The word he uses is repent. Time to change your thinking, do a complete 180 and believe the good news. You realize that when we sin, we're not trusting the good news of who Jesus is, what he's done and what he yet will do. We just take matters into our own hands and that self-centered perspective produces sin. It's not trusting Jesus. One of the characteristic features of Lent is a prayer of confession, where we confess, where we repent. We have a prayer of confession for us to pray together in unison. It's up on the screen, let's, let's pray. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Let's continue in the spirit of prayer. Jesus, we, we want to pay close attention to you. 
uh, more than we ever have in this season and all this year long. We want to hear what you have to say. We want to want to really hear it as if for the first time and be startled by it, as if for the first time and be reassured by it. We want to be paying such close attention to you that we can't miss what you've got to say, even if we don't fully understand it. Because we trust that you're such a good teacher that not only is every word that comes from your mouth worth hearing, but that you're such a good teacher that even as we, your students, stumble around with it, don't quite get it or don't think it all the way through, you're, you're still here. You'll guide us through what we don't get or what we can't yet manage or what we're not quite ready for. So help us to listen to you. And as a corollary, Lord, as a, as a natural follow-up to that, help us to listen well to each other. So much conversation is just waiting for the other person to stop talking so I can make my point. And, well, we repent of that too. Help us to, to so treasure the people right in front of us, whether we understand them or not, whether we like them or not, whether we're tired of them or not. Help us to listen to the people right in front of us. Give us a, a grace, a settled confidence in you that we can, we can listen and take our turn to speak and wrestle together with ideas in real conversation, whether that's over Zoom or on the phone or in person. Lord, give us the grace to be in conversation with one another, especially in conversation with people that we don't quite understand or disagree with so that we can begin to love well, the actual real people in our lives. We need you to teach us. We need your power in us. We need your spirit to give us words and to settle our souls. We need you, Lord, and are glad that you are our teacher and you are our Lord and master. So equip us with your word, empower us with your spirit, bring us along the path that, that you know that we need to go. And we know that, uh, that every step in it, if guided by you, is full of life and full of hope. And so we look to you for all these things and we pray them in Christ's name, amen.
The sermon text for this morning is from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. To really get the feel for the story, to really feel the weight of the reign of Jehoshaphat and his relationship with God, it's good to read the whole chapter and even some that follow. But we'll read this morning just the last few verses of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 31 through 37. So Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 35 years old when he became king of Judah, and he reigned in Jerusalem 25 years. His mother's name was Azuba, daughter of Shili. He followed the ways of his father Asa and did not stray from them. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed, and the people still had not set their hearts on the God of their ancestors. The other events of Jehoshaphat's reign from beginning to end are written in the annals of Jehu, son of Hanani, which are recorded in the book of the kings of Israel. Later, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, made an alliance with Ahaziah, king of Israel, whose ways were wicked. He agreed with him to construct a fleet of trading ships. After these were built at Ezion Geber, Eliezer, son of Dodavahu of Merahesh, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have made an alliance with Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy what you have made. The ships were wrecked and were not able to set sail to trade. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to know what's good and right and true, and we want to keep our minds focused on it, and we want to do this all our lives long. We don't want to be a flash in the pan. We don't want to be someone who starts and then just drifts, or falls away, or counts the cost and thinks that following you is too much, too expensive, too costly. Set our hearts on what is good and right and true. Set our minds there too. Turn our minds so frequently to you that we can't mistake these things. Give us clarity, give us courage. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Have you heard about the young track star? Have you heard about the young track star, Zaya Holman? Just a freshman in college. Just a young woman who likes to run. Apparently she set a few records in high school. Just a month ago, in her first university meet as a freshman, not as a senior, she was anchoring the 4x4, 40 by, the 4x400 four relay race. She was the last runner out of four to take the baton and circle the track twice to complete her race. She started out four seconds behind. Four seconds in a 4x400 four meter race is, is, is a long time. It's a long time. And at the collegiate level, she starts out four seconds behind and her track coach watching this as a live stream, her high school track coach watching it via live stream turns to his kids and says, boy, in high school, she'd have made that up, but this is the university level. You know, she'll give it a good shot, but she's got no chance. <laughs> she takes off, she runs very quickly within the first lap passes the second place runner and then in the next lap passes the first place runner well before the the finish line, so much so that she can even slow up just a couple of steps right at the finish line. It's not even a photo finish. She, she, she blows past the two seniors who are running from other universities. She's so fast and so determined and always gets the baton last, always has in high school and now in college, and it turns out her time was so good that she would have qualified for the U.S. 2016 Olympic team in that event as a high school freshman now. She runs. She finishes. She's amazing. Hmm. Wouldn't it be great if we finished well, like Zaya Holman finishes well? Well, it's pretty clear that uh, Jehoshaphat does not finish well. You can tell this just from the, from the end of chapter, uh, chapter 20 in Second Chronicles. But just to back up just a little bit of chapter 20, let me tell you, Jehoshaphat wants to be a godly man, and his father was a godly man. He's a, Jehoshaphat's king, king of Judah, Jerusalem in the south, king of Judah in the south. Israel has split off with 10 tribes into the north. It's been uh, factions and fighting um, for, 
for generations. Jehoshaphat is one of the, one of the kings in the south that, that really wants to do well, and most of chapter 20 is about the three armies coming against him in a coalition, and he cries out to God, and he has all the people of, of Judah and Jerusalem cry out to God, and they, they form a choir to go with them into battle. They beseech God. You are the God of, of, of all people, of all nations, and you have brought our ancestors out of slavery in Egypt, and we, we need you to come through for us because we can't do this ourselves, but we know that you can. We know that you are God and we are not, and we need you now more than we ever have. And the choir is singing praises to God, and God assures them that they won't even have to fight this battle. They need to go out to the battle, but they won't even have to fight the battle because God will fight the battle for them and destroy this coalition that's coming over against them. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. On the day of the battle, there's infighting among these armies and they, they knock each other off. They're in chaos. They leave all sorts of loot behind and the day is won by the Lord. And Jehoshaphat and the people of Jerusalem and, and Judah uh, give God great praise. It's a marvelous thing, a marvelous time. In Israelite history, Jehoshaphat is a godly king who, who has pointed his people toward God and God has come through for them yet again and everybody celebrates and it's exactly what it is. It, it ought to be at this point a happy ending, except it's not the end. Our text today, uh, Jehoshaphat reigns over Judah. It's kind of a summary paragraph again. The narrator, the chronicler has backed up and said, so here's the reign. Jehoshaphat became king at 35. He reigned for 25 more years. And he was a good man like his father, except it didn't quite end that way, did it? In our text, it says, it doesn't quite end that way. Later, Verse 35, later, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, made an alliance with Ahaziah, king of Israel. You'd, you'd, want, you'd want Judah and Israel to be getting along. They are the sum together. They are the, the people of Israel, the, the descendants of Abraham and Sarah. You'd want them to have an alliance. You'd want them to be getting along, except that the tribes in the north and the kings in the north repeatedly are evil and wicked, and the whole split between north and south is because of rebellion and very early on in the north they set up an alternate temple and an alternate worship to the Israelite worship in Jerusalem in the temple. Well, Jehoshaphat has set up an alliance with Ahaziah in the north whose ways were wicked. Why do they do this? Why does Jehoshaphat do this? Well, because there's, there's money in it, right? He agreed with him Jehoshaphat agreed with Ahaziah to construct a fleet of trading ships. And after these are built, they're going to sail off the coast of the Mediterranean to trade to bring in wealth from around the known world. Wealth for Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Ahaziah in the north and Jehoshaphat in the south. And it's a reasonable plan and it's a proven get-rich plan to trade, to offer something of worth and bring back something of value. And it fails miserably. It fails miserably because God's not in it. Because the God that needed to be consulted in crisis wasn't the God that was consulted then for business. The God that was consulted when Jehoshaphat and, and his people were just at the end of the rope, uh, about to be overwhelmed by a vastly superior army. That God was not consulted in the day-to-day -day mercantile exchange, how do I go about my work? How do we pro provide for our families? How do we provide for our towns? How do we govern our cities and our country? The God of Israel, the God of Judah, wasn't involved. He wasn't asked to be involved. It wasn't like he was too distant. It wasn't like he was too busy. He wasn't invited in. So Jehoshaphat, a good man, a good king, most of his life falters and falters because he's, he thinks, it's clear he thinks there's another way or just a better way or maybe God is only for crisis. 
Jehoshaphat does not finish well. It's tempting, isn't it? To wait for a crisis, to just kind of go along about our lives like most people do, Christians and non-Christians. Go about our lives doing what we can, making do, trying to make sense out of this crazy COVID stuff. We're coming up on a year now of being in this weird shutdown, not shut down, locked in, not locked in, masked, not masked, some of us, not others of us. Does it mean something? How dangerous is this? Is it nothing? It's not nothing. We go about our days, go about our weeks. We try to get this figured out and do the best we can. And it's so tempting just to kind of leave God by the wayside. It's just so tempting to, to numb ourselves with news or with food. Or I hear, I hear alcohol consumption is up 25% across the U.S. this year, this past 10, 11, 12 months. It's pretty tempting just to, just to sort of kind of wait out the crisis or maybe wait out our middle age or wait out our school days or wait out whatever we're in the middle of until there's a crisis or until there's an opportunity and then we call God in as a kind of a consultant or a, or, or a bailout or a cavalry coming over the hill. But for how long? How long do we just make do? How long do we just work at getting by? What is it? What is it we're aiming for? It's really part of the probably the important part of the process, part, part, part of our, our processing our lives is asking the question, what is it we're aiming for? What are we trying to do? What, what's the end result we're looking for? Paul says, Paul says in Acts chapter 20, I consider my life worth nothing to me. I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. It's an amazing statement. I consider my life worth nothing to me except what God has given me to do. Now, God has not given you or me the same job as the Apostle Paul, nor certainly the same job as Jesus, nor certainly the same job as the person across the breakfast table or across the aisle. Or He gives us all a little bit different jobs, different roles, and maybe even different roles at different times. But Paul's whole orientation is toward God, to serve Jesus, whatever that means in his particular context. It's a marvelous, very short verse. Luke 9, 51, Jesus set his face resolutely toward Jerusalem. And Luke has 24 chapters. This is the end of Luke chapter 9. Luke points out to us readers that, to we readers that, and Jesus sets out resolutely for Jerusalem because we know what's going to happen in Jerusalem because we've read the story. We've heard the story. Jesus knows what's going to happen in Jerusalem. He's going to go up. He's going to be betrayed, arrested, uh, scourged, beaten. He's going to die and on the third day rise. What, uh, what Mary read for us this morning from uh, from uh, did we read from Mark? Did we read from, I have it here. We read the account in Mark rather than in Matthew. What Mary read for us from the Gospel of Mark shows that Jesus was very clear about what his role was, about what his method was, about what his, his path was. And he was not going to be dissuaded from it because as he says often in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, the Father and I are one. We are of one mind. Uh, I do only what the Father gives me to do. I, give the, I say the words the Father gives me. And Jesus is very clear that his life has a path and a destination, and the way to live that is to stay in constant communication with the Father as he goes along. Now, very clearly, Jesus' life is not your life. We depend on his life. We depend on him being who he is but we can go to school on him. We, back a few decades ago, when I, when I golfed a little bit, when you, the, the foursome, when it gets up to the green, whoever's farthest away has to hit first so that the others can watch how the ball travels on the green and they go to school on him. They look to see, ah, broke to the left. I'm not gonna make that mistake. 
We can go to school on Jesus. We don't, and he wants us to. We don't cheat at all by watching how Jesus approaches life. We just recognize that we're not Jesus, and we know that his dedication to the Father and his confidence, his absolute confidence in the Father is something we can learn from. Because while our finish won't be like Jesus' finish, we do want to finish well. It is part of how God does things that he does not allow us, most of us, the great vast majority of us, to see how our lives will end or even what the purpose, that kind of meaning of the word end, what the purpose of our lives is. But we have this great opportunity through all the ups and downs and all the challenges of life to say, I'm going to put one foot in front of the other following Jesus because he knows what my life is about. We, and, we don't want to, and we want to do that whether we have a spectacular initial conversion or whether we've grown up in the church. We want to do that whether we have a, this fantastic, riveting testimony that people want to come from miles around to hear or whether we really have lived pretty much our whole life putting one foot in front of the other, maybe putting a plate on the table or doing the dishes afterwards. Maybe our lives have not been grand and glorious from the world's perspective or even from our own perspective. But it's clear that whatever our lives are about, if they are offered to Jesus, they're not a waste. And whatever they're about, we dare not waste them by failing to finish. We don't want to waste our lives by making obvious foolish choices to gratify ourselves. Spectacularly awful choices. I read recently of a minister who was 20, 25 years into his marriage and uh, into ministry, and he decided that it was just time to uh, find a younger woman, marry the younger woman, and ride off into the sunset. And one of his friends called him aside and said, what, what do you think you're doing? What, what's going on here? You pledged to love this woman and be married to this woman forever, under any and all circumstances. That's what love is. And the minister who had had the affair and then remarried and, and rode off into the sunset said, no, don't I deserve to be happy? I think I deserve a little happiness. Which, of course, is a spectacularly foolish thing to do. Spectacularly, willfully short-sighted thing. It's not love to break that kind of vow. It's not love to, to say, you know, yes, I've been a good person, but now it's me time, and now it's my time. Yes, I've served others, but... I'm done with that now. God, because what we're saying in effect is, God's not enough, I gotta get mine. And while you and I do not generally make that kind of spectacular, foolish decision, part of what we do in Lent is to remember, yeah, one foot in front of the other, one day after the next, we are gonna follow Jesus, we are gonna let him clean us out of whatever needs to be cleaned out, we're gonna be wide open about uh, with him about what our sins and feelings are so that he can be our strength and our health and our holiness. Because we want to finish well. We don't want to say, hey, boy, I, I tried being a Christian. I, I tried being good. And, and trying is part of it. There is effort involved. There's absolutely effort involved in following Jesus. There's effort involved in, in doing anything worthwhile, especially doing it well over time. All the more so, there's effort involved, but we have strength from Jesus. And it's not our effort that saves us, of course. Let me say that again. It's not our effort that saves us. We simply put out the effort in response to the goodness of God, an effort so that we can, from Jesus, receive the kind of strength and maturity that he can provide for us. And James says, let pers perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. James 1, 4, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And Paul in the uh, 1 Corinthians 9 that Mary read for us today, and you remember Paul talking about beating his body so that he can, he wants to discipline himself so that he can finish the race well. There are so many temptations on every side and we are actively opposed by the evil one. Of course it's difficult. It's going to be difficult. The question is, what do we do with the difficulties that come? 
one foot in front of the other, one step after the next, one day to the next, we follow Jesus. We turn our minds to him, we open our hearts to him, we take correction from him, we take strength from him. Jesus, you remember, went up to Jerusalem. He predicted his own death. He knew it was gonna happen, he knew it needed to happen, and he finished. You remember on the cross, you remember on the cross, he ends, he dies by saying, it is finished. That's what he came to do. Now, of course, he's finished then and he's raised on the third day. We know the rest of the story, the astonishingly good story. But how hard it must have been to be Jesus and take that path. And some days, how hard it is to be you. Seriously. And yet one day after another, one foot in front of another, we move forward so that we can finish well, whatever finishing means in your role, in your case. We are looking forward to the day when Jesus can say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. We are working for the day, not when we impress Jesus, but when we come to the last, whatever that last might be, when we are a bit more wise than we are now, when we are a bit more kind than we are now, when we are a bit more honest and gracious and truthful and forgiving than we are now, a bit more today and tomorrow and the next day. Not everybody's a track star, not everybody can can fly like Zaya Holman can fly. She's a fleet and it's a great gift from God and I hope she recognizes that and celebrates that and, and feels God's pleasure when she runs. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Not everybody's fast like that, but everybody can finish well. By the grace of God, everybody can finish well. You can finish well. I can finish well. If we allow God to have say in our lives, if we allow Jesus to hold sway over our lives, if we allow him to work in us in spiritual practices and disciplines and self-discipline and restraint and just a humble, gracious openness to him, he can help us to finish well, finish high school well, finish midlife well, finish our whole lives well. Jesus is that good. He's just ahead of us. Let's follow him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we need all kinds of instruction and energy and cleansing from you. We need your strength. Some days we really want to know what our lives are about and why they weren't different than they are. Some days we, we really, we wish there was some explanation as to where we are now and, and why things are the way they are. In our calmer, quieter moments, Lord, we, we know that all we have to do is put put the next foot forward, put not, not even our best foot forward, just, just to, to hang on to you and just to follow you as closely as we can and just to turn our lives over daily to you, to take up our cross daily and follow you. Lord, help us not to worry so much about results. Help us not to worry so much about legacy. Help us not to worry so much about making a name for ourselves, but just to follow you wherever you lead, in our lives, in our context, in our families, in our work. And help us to do this tomorrow and the day after that and every day that's called today so that we can hear one day your welcome home. Thank you for your power at work among us. Thank you for your great goodness that you pour into us. Thank you for these marvelous opportunities to, to test and to trust your strength. Thank you that you're at work in us. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Go now in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forever, forever, forever. Amen.